you came through Times Square, but if you did, thank you for braving Super Bowl Boulevard. Um, big thanks to Anthony Townsend for being our speaker this evening. We're really happy to have you. Uh, I am Kate Maloff, Director of Programs here at World Policy Institute. And for those of you who are new, we are a Center for Global Thought Leadership based um, based here in New York, of course. And we are focused on the crucial but neglected challenges of an interdependent world. Uh, through the World Policy Journal and blog, and through our fellows program, and through events like these, we focus on a global perspective, and innovative transformative thinking, and a diversity of ideas. These are meant to be, again, for those of you who are new, these are meant to be very informal and interactive. Uh, we leave most of the time for you to ask questions, so I encourage everybody to eat and drink and tweet. This is on the record. You'll find Anthony and Greg's Twitter handles on the sheet of paper in front of you. Uh, I want you to ask questions, challenge our speakers. I think they're, I think they're ready for you. And if you're, if you, if you hear something you like or hear something interesting, find two members said it and exchange business cards and come back again because this is how our garden grows. Uh, before I hand it over to Greg, our moderator, I want to thank the very good people at Young Professionals in Foreign Policy who are sponsoring this evening's discussion. And without further ado, Greg Lindsay, our moderator for this evening, is my. My favorite fellow, my favorite senior fellow, Eric is an associate <laughs> fellow. Uh, you have his bio in front of you, I won't repeat it, but he is the author of Eritropolis and director of World Policy's Emergent Cities Project. Thank you, Take Kate. it away, thank you so much. Thank you, Kate, thank you all for coming. Thank you again, YPFP, for your sponsorship of this evening's event. Also, thank you to the folks at Heinrich Bowl for their sponsorship of the series at large. Um, and thank you especially to Anthony for joining us this evening. Um, Again, you have his bio, so I won't belabor it in introducing him, uh, except to say that you know, Anthony started his career uh, in academia at, at New York University, where he's now a senior fellow at uh, Rudin, Rudin Center for Transportation Policy and Management, where I'm also that visiting. Rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? does roll off the tongue. Where I'm also a visiting scholar, so I'm in the tank here for him. Um, and, uh, and then went to MIT to get his PhD in urban planning, where he studied under Bill Mitchell, uh, who really laid out the first principles uh, for networked urbanism before his untimely death a few years ago. Um, and then he spent the last eight years at the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto, um, working with Fortune 500 companies to really forecast the future and dealing with these many issues uh, before coming back to New York now on a full-time basis as a senior fellow at Rudin, working on the future of mobility issues. Um, and so, you know, without further ado here, uh, I'm going to dive in. I had a brief video plan. Uh, I don't know if we'll be able to show it. It's a Cisco Super Bowl ad for the Internet of Everything, um, which we really were afraid about to describe it. But it's an ad that basically shows, you know, it's a, the whole chain of events. Once we start networking everything together in an urban context, the home, the family, the commute, the autonomous car, uh, you know, replete with sort of beautiful visions of glass and, uh, and, and pristine knowledge work um, that is sort of positioned as what a smart city is. Um, and considering this is the title, I guess we'll dive into the questions and by Anthony's request. Um, what is a smart city? This is what you took for the title of your book. IBM, Cisco, Siemens, many corporations have been trying to define what the smart cities of the future will be. Um, how would they define it in your, in your words? And how would you like to take it back from them and define it in your own? This is a way to yeah, that's a good place to start. Um, so um, a lot of times when urban planners or policy makers or people are interested in, in, in cities talk about smart, they're usually talking about smart growth, which is a whole collection of policies um, and ideas about urban design, um, ideas about um, transportation policy that are generally um, trying to accomplish things like densification, greenhouse gas reduction, equity, um, you know, preserving natural landscapes. And that's, I think, really, that is the big goal of all this stuff. Um, when you're trying to make cities better, make them healthier, um, make them more sustainable. Um, but uh, I decided to pick off um, one piece of that, that whole package that's really critical, which is the use of new information technologies. So the way I, I define smart cities are basically communities where people are using new information technologies to solve time timeless problems, cities, whether that's health or traffic or congestion. Um, and the reason I did that, and I, and I say that right up front in the book, and people have criticized the book because it doesn't address any of these other things, like bike lanes or 
uh, you know, growth boundaries or whatever. Um, and that's not what the book is about. The book is very specifically about the technologies that are being used to address these problems and all the opportunities and all the challenges that cause. Um, now, um, there's a lot of other terms that um, different corporations have bandied about to try to describe pretty much the same thing. So um, IBM uses smarter planet and smarter cities. Um, Cisco uses um, what they call intelligent urbanization or um, smart and connected uh, communities. Um, there's a whole bunch of, of these terms out there, and there's you know sort of like a, a brand name and meme war that's been going on for a number of years. But um, the smart cities one seems to be sticking, and it's interesting. Uh, the reason I say that it's sticking is not because of anything I did, but because it's actually being adopted now um, across across a slew of countries from China to uh, Finland, to the UK, uh, to Mexico, <coughs> as the way that, that policymakers talk about this stuff at a national level. So um, I think it's some term that's sort of there to stay. And um, I think it's increasingly focusing in on the technology piece because um, you know, technology's not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve every urban problem. But I think almost every solution that gets deployed in any area of urban management, urban planning, is going to have a technological component. Um, and, and a pretty robust one that adds a lot of value. So it's really important to focus on, I think, on that piece, at least you know, for this part of the discussion. Well, that, that conversation <coughs> on smart cities as a technological city, that really dates specifically. I mean, you can actually date the moment where that conversation started when IBM's then CEO, Sam Palmisano, gave a speech to the Council on Foreign Relations in you know, like three days after Election Day in 2008 and really introduced the notion of Smarter Planet, their massive campaign, which I think they've spent a quarter of a billion dollars now in advertising it, and defining it forward, that smart cities were going to be about using technology and, and for sustainability and all these sorts of other aims. But of course, it goes back much, much further than that. As I was hoping you could talk a bit about sort of the origins of this, which go back to ubiquitous computing. Oh my god, it goes back to, it, to the 1890 census. All right, so, so yeah, so what, is, what is the deep history um, of I'm, smart cities? I'm going to talk real quick about 2008, because 2008 was a really interesting year for this, and I didn't really realize it until sitting down to write the introduction to the book, like, um, I guess it did in 2012, maybe in 2013. Um, and so, um, yes, this year that IBM launched a smarter planet, which is a watershed moment for a lot of these sort of corporate ambitions to wire up the planet, um, wire up our infrastructure. Um, but it was also the year, um, it was the year that the UN forecast that the world would become 50% urban for the first time. I think the, the retrospect didn't actually happen until early 2009, but everybody says it was 2008 because that was the forecast. So that's, you know, urban species forever now. Um, it's also the year, according to the ITU, that we have more mobile broadband connections worldwide than fixed ones. So mm -hmm. the internet's untethered, you know, the whole idea of sitting down at an electronic typewriter, right, to log on to this virtual space is, is gone as well. I mean, the internet is it's always with us, it's always around us. Um, and then the third thing, which Cisco announced actually in 2011, was that 2008 was the first year that there were more things connected to the internet than people. So city buses, coffee pots, thermostats, whatever it is, um, you know, increasingly the internet's not about again, us going into these virtual spaces and interacting with information, it's about objects in the physical world being connected and wiring up the physical world, which he's now calling the industrial internet, which is another one of these terms that, that's being used in corporate marketers. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can go all the way back to the first human settlements in the Middle East, and like as soon as people settle down to start farming, they invent writing to keep track of all the surplus, right? <laughs> Whose grain is in the, in the grain area? Um, what are the laws, you know, that the king's issuing? What are the religious beliefs that we need to write down? And so information technology is driven by the need to manage complex societies. And you see that precisely <coughs> at any point in history. And you see um, in the 1850s, um, when Barcelona, when, when they tore down the city wall of Barcelona, uh, because it was expanding very rapidly, industrializing. <coughs> and they planned the Eschampler, the expansion. Um, which was one of the first like really rational city plans. The infrastructure plan include, included um, four different kinds of conduit for utilities. There was water, um, natural gas, which was mostly for lighting, uh, sewage, and there was no electric power at the time. But the fourth utility in Barcelona in 1855 was the telegraph, hmm. um, because the, the guy that planned it was obsessed with uh, telegraph and the train as sort of the modernizing technologies of the city. 
Um, and then come uh, you know, 160 years later, and Cisco uh, systems, the CEO is running around talking about the internet as the fourth utility. So the idea that like telecommunications is the fourth utility is at least 150 years old. Um, I think that's really interesting. And I, I wrote quite a bit about that in the book. The other kind of uh, historical story that I think is fascinating is that ties sort of our urban boom in the 19th century in the West with the urban boom that's happening now around the world. Um, is the 1890 census in the United States. Okay, so this is um, the largest information gathering exercise in human history. Um, probably five to 10 times the size of what they had gathered in 1880. And the reason for that is that America's cities were booming and um, Congress was mostly a bunch of rural farmers who were freaked out by immigrants, freaked out by cities, and freaked out by the changes that were happening in the economy. And so they wanted to understand them and the commission's massive expansion census. And uh, the 1880 census had taken seven years to count. And so they were like, oh my god, we're never going to be able to count the census. And so uh, an enterprising young census clerk, Herman Hollerith, invents a, uh, basically an electronic, electromechanical punch card tabulator. And they count the census in three years. And he goes on to license this machine to governments around the world, to railroad companies so that they could manage their enterprises and starts a company in 1910 and a series of mergers and acquisitions. That's the company that becomes IBM in 1924, who is the biggest player right, in smart cities and urban technology today. So you essentially have you know, the biggest industrial proponent of applying information technology to, to the problems of running cities is the one that sort of started that business 100 years ago during this first wave of industrialization. And I just, I, when I realized that, I was just so floored. I, I really couldn't believe because it all of a sudden took this really kind of techy, abstract, you know, like gee whiz, um, super fast computer story about what's happening and, and made it like just like a timeless piece of urbanism, really. Um, and so, you know, that's the kind of thing. The reason I, I like these stories is because it allows you to like demythologize de and debunk a lot of these really um, grandiose claims. That, that I think these technology companies are making about um, what we can do with these technologies and how novel they are. Um, and I think, to me, that was a story that I wanted to get across to just to just kind of, I don't know, like not pop, pop the bubble, but just get people to relax a little bit about this stuff and not see it as such a foreign thing. It's actually, it's part of how it's always built. Well, yeah, I want to get into, uh, for a minute, the, the um, it's interesting, you know, obviously there's a tension in any network, right, between t centralization and decentralization. Networks seem to tend towards sort of both extremes. Um, I and that sort of seems to be a tension at the heart of the book as well, where you spend much of it describing uh, the centralization techniques of IBM uh, and the Rio de Janeiro Control Center, and also sort of the bottom-up networks enabled by, you know, the, la the urban lattice of Foursquare and others. Um, you know, considering this is the World Policy Institute, I guess I want to break this into two questions and start with, I was hoping you could talk a bit about, I guess, sort of the policy implications for urban governance in, you know, in the, in the era of smart cities. Um, you know, IBM and Rio and what that's sort of done as well, and also the fact that, you know, Cisco, for example, which is really fit in this, um, they've cut deals with the Saudi government to build six economic cities from scratch. They were implicated by the Wall Street Journal in helping to build a massive surveillance network in Chongqing mm -hmm. um, and others. I mean, how how is this how is this technology being deployed in cities, um, both for massive centralization and both for massive decentralization? So, um, I, I guess in terms of policy issues, the thing that I'm the most worried about is that um, the main way that um, all of these new technology solutions, whether it's for policing or um, delivery of healthcare services or whatever, um, or urban surveillance. The primary financing mechanism for them are public-private partnerships, mm -hmm. and this is because anywhere around the world you look, but maybe with the exception of the Gulf states, municipal governments are really strapped for cash. Um, you know, at the same time that governments are pushing responsibility back down um, across the board, I think, um, and, and developing power, the money's not coming with it. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, it's sort of like, okay, now you have the power, but um, you know, you've been for yourself. And so, you know, you've got a bunch of um, very cash-rich companies. Um, you've got uh, financiers who've gotten very sophisticated about figuring out how to um, make deals with governments, um, you know, where they can get control of the public asset and sort of, you know, milk it for a while. 
uh, often improve the delivery of the services, improve maintenance of, of those assets. But um, what happens, um, what, so where that starts, public-private partnerships, I think, have, have been a very creative financing mechanism for, for local projects. When they start to get really problematic in the smart city realm, is uh, when you start to think about the value of the data that's generated by whatever it is that's being privatized, a parking meter system like they did in Chicago, a water utility, right? I mean, Veolia mm -hmm. is all over the world running water utilities, very aggressively trying to think about how they monetize data about water usage in cities. Um, they're, they're one of the main sponsors of the Sensible City Lab up at MIT. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, some, some cities like New York, San Francisco maybe, London, will have the legal and the technical capacity in-house to write good contracts when they write a contract with, with a partner in the private sector. Um, and, and some of the things that I think they'll be looking out for is who owns the data that gets produced by our public infrastructure or by the service that you're running on our behalf. Um, where is it stored physically? So you know, in Rio, um, they built a data center in Rio, so presumably, all of the data that's being gener generated by the Smart Rio platform, this control center for the city, is within their jurisdiction. And if it's not in Rio, it's probably in Brazil somewhere. So they've got a legal uh, mechanism to take control of it, to delete it, to do whatever they want with it. Um, but the, the way that IBM in particular has architected that solution to sell to other cities is that it's basically a web service. Mm -hmm. So in Rio, you know, there's a data center and a big giant screen, and Everything's happening in that room. It's almost like just a massive computer. But when they start selling it to Johannesburg and, and Jakarta, they're going to run it from their data center, wherever it's most economical for them to do it. And it's just going to be a web browser on a big screen somewhere. And that starts to raise questions like, OK, well, is my data, is it even in my country? Mm -hmm. um, where is it? You know, like, Does the NSA have a tap on it? Probably, right? So, um, and, and you know, the side note that's interesting about that is that essentially, again, it's not selling a product or selling a service. And that makes it a much more difficult partnership to get out of if you change your mind um, down the road because it's all proprietary. Um, and, you know, you're going to go through this terrible process of moving all your old data over to some new system when IBM doesn't want to cooperate. Yeah. Um, and what's really crazy about that, to tie it back to that census story again, is that's the same way that Hollerin, um did his deal with the Census Bureau. He didn't sell them the tabulating machines, he leased them. <coughs> and he also Census is a service. But he also charged them for every card counter, mm -hmm. you know, ensuring that as the census exploded, his revenues were exploded, and he also charged them for the cards, the paper itself. So it was like, it was this really kind of usurious business model um, that, you know, what you paid scaled with how valuable it was to you, not, you know, it wasn't like a flat thing. And it so pissed the Census Bureau off that they basically built their own machine and violated his patent and, and basically crushed him. And he ended up selling out to some Wall Street financiers uh, in the end. But um, you know, it, it, to me, that was like a really kind of um, interesting foreshadowing of the kinds of, of it, it, the kinds of debates, that, the um, challenges that cities are going to have yeah. with the vendors of, of but the sensing infrastructure and the, and the stuff that's used to analyze. That's all very interesting, but I want to get more dystopian here, because I want you to delve into this. So uh, it's funny, you have a whole chapter in your book devoted to buggy, brittle, and bugs. That was my Tom Friedman chapter title. That was, was your Tom Friedman chapter title, but your book came out uh, too late to include the Snowden revelations, yeah. which really gets into this too. I mean, if the internet of everything happens, and we know that the NSA is everywhere in the internet, does that mean uh, either we let the NSA has back doors into everything we have, if we're Americans, or that we're going to have Chinese cyber attacks on the city itself. What, is, what does it look like when we're going to have denial of service attacks on everyday life and that sort of thing? What are the really disastrous scenarios uh, if the smart city fails, if the smart city were simply turn off? Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm working we'll on against us. I'm working on like an epilogue now for the, the paperback version of the book. And um, it's still very rough, but what I've come down to is sort of a, a narrative is everything that I said in this book multiplied by 10. Like I was basically too timid. Um, and that gets down to the, the market opportunity. So, you know, when I, when I started writing, the, the most trusted forecast of how big the smart city market would be in 2020 was like $100 billion a year worldwide. The UK government just published a forecast uh, they did with Arup, an engineering firm, that's more like $500 billion a year. Um, and the numbers just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. 
Um, but the, 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 risk of, the risks of surveillance and the um, amount of data that is being exposed, that's being collected and that's being exposed, and the ways in which it can be um, uh, sliced and analyzed uh, that really raise serious questions about um, privacy. So the same in Kepman's group at MIT, um, you know, they are pretty confident that they only need to see four location, four of your like cell phone location points or Wi-Fi location points and they can uniquely identify it. Um, and that's um, almost impossible to wrap your head around, but it's, it's probably true, right? Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I think it's still sorting out how um, how people are responding to that. And just to, just to give you a case in point, um, there's a lot of uh, <coughs> interest now in um, uh, technologies that track individual shoppers and retail sales. Wall Street um, Journal is right, but also on city streets. Mm -hmm. um, so picking up the signals that your your smartphone is using all the time to ping a cell phone tower to make sure that it, it knows where it is. Um, scanning for Wi-Fi signals, scanning for Bluetooth. I mean, your your devices are throwing off all these spurious radio signals that are, are unique to your device, and so it's very easy to use that as a unique track for you. And um, so yeah, there was a, a firm in Canada that's doing this. They, they set up all of downtown Toronto with Wi-Fi beacons. And they're, they're developing all this data. They're selling it to retailers. And they're like, hey, Greg's coming. You know? Um, if Greg's your, 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 one of your good customers. So I can get that Starbucks coupon right. that people have been talking about right. for the last 20 years. So you can, they can get ready for Greg, and they can, they can get all the, the vodka out on the table. I don't know what it is that you want. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, there was, like, absolutely no public reaction to that. It was just like a wall, it was an <clears throat> article in the Wall Street Journal about, look at these clever guys and their business. It didn't blow up on the blogs. I mean, maybe they're too occupied with Rob Ford up there, but it didn't blow up on the Toronto blogs. This is a massive violation of privacy or whatever. Yet, like three months before that, someone doing almost exactly the same thing in the city of London using um, trackers located in trash cans. And it was like an international scandal. I mean, people went crazy about it. The city of London like cracked down and banned it and had it all ripped out. And um, it was so bizarre to me because it was the exact same thing in two very similar cultures, you know, two kind of global financial centers. And the, the response was just totally bipolar. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think people are still just sorting through um, the understanding the amount of data that they leave behind, uh, starting to recognize just how easy it is to hoover it up, whether you're the NSA or a Russian gang mm -hmm. uh, or you know, the Chinese government looking for trade secrets. Um, and then I think, you know, sorting through what that means in any particular urban context, urban setting, gets ten times more complicated. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think it's going to take a very, it's, it's not a problem that's going to get solved anywhere, it's a dilemma. It's going to take decades to work through. Um, what I really enjoy are the, the people you know, that the media artists and, and, and hackers that are experimenting with countermeasures. Mm -hmm. um, so um, New York actually has a very long tradition of this, going back to uh, a group that I wrote about in the 90s called the Surveillance Camera Players. Mm -hmm. When CCTV started sprouting up all over Manhattan the sidewalks, they would go and act out little plays, little vignettes about like totalitarianism in front of these cameras. And, you know, the, the, the thing that was really avant-garde about it is that the audience was supposed to be the person watching the camera. So it was all challenging people to ask who's watching the camera. And as often as not, there's probably some poor sucker like in a call center in India somewhere, but because um, they, you know, they pay people as little as possible. Um, but uh, yeah, that tradition has lived on. And, um, actually, ITP, uh, Interactive Telecommunications Program at NYU, every year there's a student there who's doing some kind of anti surveillance uh, project. So um, there's a guy, I think his name is Adam Harvey, developed a face painting technique um, based on World War One British anti-sub camouflage. So it's called Dazzle, and it uses a series of like uh, white and, and black pol uh, triangles, and it really screws with your depth perception. And this is in the age where like, the U-boat commander still had to manually set the fuse on the torpedo, and um, they wouldn't be able to figure out how far away it is. It turns out that it's also pretty good at fooling some of the more um, commonly used face recognition algorithms, mm -hmm. which try to identify points on your face and create a unique fingerprint. Um, uh, he also, the next year, built a, um, what's essentially a, um, a cloak that um, creates a Faraday cage that hides you. Um, your infrared signature, all your electromagnetic stuff coming off of your, your devices, 
uh, and your face from drones overhead. Um, and so the idea of like you know people running around cities like uh, hobbits, you know, from the Lord of the Rings, hiding from drones. <laughs> <laughs> One of dystopian, that's pretty dystopian. In, in the future, so. we will all be Bruce Sterling novels for 15 minutes. Um, uh, I'd ask one more question before we open it up to the floor here. This is your cue to get more food, to get more wine. Please do not feel obliged to actually listen to us if you want to get yourself some more <laughs> wine. Um, I, would, I would say, I would, all right, so we focus on the dystopian side. You know, the subtitle of your book is, in part, Big Data Civic Hackers and the Quest for a New Utopia. Ostensibly, you share some utopian visions. And you know, you spend a lot of the book discussing you know, sort of the bottom up percolating that's happened. I mean, there's a couple there's a couple mentions in here of Foursquare and Dennis Crowley, as you know, um, from your time here in New York. Um, and you talk about the sort of the lattice over the city, which I think is really interesting. The, the New York Times Magazine, some of you may have seen it, went back and reviewed Holly White studies of Bryant Park uh, in, the, in the 1970s and found that our mobile technology, rather than driving us apart in public spaces, is actually causing us to use public space more, partly because we can plug into the cloud from public space and enjoy it. Um, and so I was hoping you could talk a bit about, I think, what you think is happening in terms of urban policy from the fact that we, we're now adding these layers of information onto the city, which is enabling new capabilities to the city and new ways to enjoy the city. I think this has to be part of the whole story behind the return of the city that Richard Florida and Ed Glazer and others have, have promoted so vigorously. I think what's really interesting is there's, there's like a huge divide right now between arguably the two most important trends in urbanism or probably the two trends that will shape urban planning and policy, I think, over the coming decades. And the one is what we've been talking about, this um, urge to use sensing and computation and remote control to simplify the city, mm -hmm. okay? To, to automate things that are manual now or things that aren't even done now, you know, traffic management, um, uh, logistics, whatever, policing, um, and uh, dispatching of emergency vehicles, whatever it is. And you know, there's there's a whole set of assumptions embedded in that around you know it's sort of like the modernist fantasy on steroids, right? It's like we're going to rationalize the city and control it and do that from a central point of view, a central point of power. <coughs> and that's you know that's the urban engineers. Let's call them the urban engineers are pushing that. Um, on the other hand, there's um, a whole renaissance going on in urban studies. Uh, also being driven by the data that's being collected by cities that's pulling in for the first time in 50 years people from the physical sciences, mathematicians, complexity uh, scientists, and the reason why they're attracted to it and the things that they're asserting and proving and discovering and exploring are that cities are incredibly complicated, right? I mean, for great physicists to, to not want to study string theory or what's happening in Switzerland with the accelerator and the discovery of the God particle and study cities in, instead, says to you that there is something incredibly fascinating and incredibly complicated to understand there. Um, and so to me that's really interesting because on the one hand, you've got these people that are trying to use technology to, to be like Robert Moses on steroids, right? Mm -hmm. um, and on the other hand, you've got people who are intellectually like in the Jane Jacobs, Richard Florida camp that cities are built up from the bottom up of all the tiny little interactions and order sort of emerges from the bottom up and actually being able to start to quantify that. Um, and so I don't know how that's going to get resolved, because increasingly, the science is going to tell us that we need to intervene at a small level, um, and we need to innovate at a, at a small level in order for things to address people's problems. It's almost like um, what in the tech world you would call user-centered design. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like citizen-centered urbanism. Um, and it's building on a lot of traditions and planning. And on the other hand, you've got you know people putting in these massive systems of control. Um, and I, I just see inevitably, and it's a vast <coughs> oversimplification, but just as like a, a thinking tool, you know, what if we see the same kinds of conflicts over smart city um, <coughs> developments that we saw over um, you know the, the construction of urban expressways and the just like colossal battles? And I, I write about. Um, in, in the third chapter, when I start to connect some of this stuff back to urban tradition, um, you know the fights that Moses and Jacobs had in New York over over expressways, and um, you know in the process, like urban planning as an institution was completely gutted, and it still hasn't really recovered from that. Um, and um, you know a lot of people, uh, Nicholas Orsoff wrote a column when uh, right after Jacobs died, I think, mm -hmm. he was saying like. You know, we glorified the bottom up so much, I wish we still had the ability to build big a little bit. So, you know, I think when you ask about centralization and decentralization, I think I think what we need to get to is a, is a new balance 
um, and find a way. And this is this is where I sort of end on an optimistic note that I think it's civic leaders. I think it's people in city government. Uh, there's a whole slew of mayors um, that have really embraced this stuff and seen it as a way to, to um, create better cities. And they've gotten very smart. This is what's happened since 2008. Is they've been educated about what the IBMs of the world can do and what the app developers and the crazy wireless community people can do and figure out how to pull that all together and, and to create things that actually help people. So, um, you know, in the end, I'm, I'm optimistic about that. And what I, the way I ended the book wasn't with like a design for the new utopia, like this is what it's going to look like, yeah. but rather like a set of um, what I call new civics for smart cities, civic principles, almost like a checklist or a scorecard. Like, okay, if you're looking at a smart city a proposed project, you know, is it using crowdsourcing to amplify resources for everybody, or is it only doing it for a selected few? Um, if you, is your um, uh, solution going to fail gracefully, or is it going to fail catastrophically? Like, our cell phone networks failed during Sandy, right? Yes. Oh, wow, all of a sudden, you know, we discovered that we only have four-hour batteries on this thing, um, yet these are some of the most profitable companies in, in the world. Um, they can afford to buy some bigger batteries, you know? Um, and that, you know, impeded response and everything. So. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's like 13 principles that are sort of like a checklist that I think, um, you know, we should, we should scrutinize every smart city project. Right? And if you want those 13 principles, buy the book, buy the book. <laughs> books for sale right here, they'll happily sign to you and sell you the 13 principles. Um, do we have any questions? I can keep talking to him for a while, but yes, we've got a few back here. Please, go back first. Anthony, is there a risk that in these smart cities, uh, the folks who aren't online, starting with the homeless, become even less visible? A surprising number of homeless people are online, actually. Um, I first started noticing this about 10 years ago, um, that a lot of homeless people have mobile phones. And a surprising number actually have smartphones. I don't know where they're getting them. But you know, in this world, it's much more important to have a phone number if you're looking for a job or housing than to have an address. Um, you know, So um, that's actually been, been something that, um, but now I have a whole chapter about the poor um, called Have Nots. And it's about. Um, how this stuff can both create opportunities for economic development, but also how it can be used to, you know, divide, fragment, and control <coughs> populations. Um, so, you know, let's go back to dystopia. Mm -hmm. um, one of the scenarios that I posited in the book um, for Rio, because, you know, this Rio has a very progressive kind of entrepreneurial Bloomberg-style mayor right now. He's trying to get the city. Okay. He's trying to get the city ready for, for the World Cup and the Olympics. And a lot of that's about control, right? I mean, Richard Norton at the Naval War College called uh, Rio de Janeiro a feral city at one point. Um, so he's trying to assert control. Um, and, um, you know, uh, as they build out this smart infrastructure and start to be able to control, say, the, the power grid of the city, um, they'll be able to do great things for the poor communities, you know, like deliver clean power, you know, reduce the number of blackouts, whatever. Um, but you think of these same infrastructures of control falling into the hands of, of the bad guys. So what if you get a revanchist government in Rio that kind of wants to go back to the old ways? You can imagine a scenario where they start like turning down the smart grid on the favelas that didn't vote for them, browning them out with this remote control to the point where they're miserable, but they're not an open revolt. You sound like and a resident of New Jersey. Which <laughs> 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 is in fact a resident of New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Yes, mm -hmm. it's it's the it's the 21st century version of um, time for some traffic. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I think so. Uh, and another note um, is that the, the book actually started uh, with the forecast that I did for the Rockefeller Foundation on that, that topic of cities, information, and inclusion, trying to understand what the world of big data means for the poor, um, both in the U.S. And, and globally as well. And so we met both the opportunities and the risks. Um, it's called a Planet of Civic Laboratories, and it's online. You can any other questions? There's one in the back. Yeah, no, way in the back. Um, so you kind of touched on this already, but I like to imagine my life turning into minority report, you know, eventually. <laughs> and I was wondering if you did any research into law enforcement and what the, you know, what the implications are for a smart city and what the ethics are involved in that. Yeah, the only area I got into law enforcement was um, talking about um, CompStat, which is, you know, the um, now 20 year old system of data-driven management that um, the NYPD uses to basically to allocate, reallocate um, police force uh, on a, I think a weekly basis. And you know, if you've watched The Wire, um, The Wire gets into the lots 
of issues around the dark side of data driven <coughs> uh, the whole idea of juking the stats. And I think the, the issue that raises is really fundamental because if you make decisions based on data, there are going to be incentives to manipulate the data. And unless you're actively auditing and scrutinizing and sort of navel gazing around that, the unintended consequences are, are really severe. And so some of the things that have been um, leveled against CompStat is that it incentivizes you know, people at all levels, but particularly like line police, to reclassify felonies as misdemeanors, to discourage citizens from reporting the crimes in the first place. Um, and you know, those are those are valid criticisms. I don't think any of them have been proven, but they raise some really serious questions about about data quality in data driven city management. But the flip side of that is, you know, we know from Sandy Pentland's group, the other papers, that with you know three data points, they can figure out where you'll be tomorrow at 3:30 p.m. with 90% accuracy. And we also know that Santa Barbara has effectively created pre-crime with some of the policing there. I mean, are we going to live in a pre-crime universe where? You know, if it decides these neighbor, you know, it, it, I mean, even a sense that they want, they're going to preemptively arrest you, they're waiting for you. It's almost borderline entrapment there, where the data will point you to that moment. It, it, it creates, I don't know what kind of legal issues it creates. I mean, you're still committing a crime, but um, you know, where does it start pointing us in the sense of? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm not an expert on that stuff. There's a guy named um, I can't remember his name, but he runs a group called the Future Crime Institute. Mark Goodman. Mark Goodman. Yeah. yeah. So I've written some really interesting stuff on this, and he, I think he was a. a cop in LA and then got involved with Interpol for a while. Um, and he's, he's really, I think, the, the top sort of um, uh, outside the box thinker and stuff. But, um, you know, IBM wants, wants to make big money out of it. They did a big project in uh, Memphis or Nashville where it's a, it's a predictive analytics. Um, it's basically predicting uh, upcoming hotspots um, for crime based on historical data that, you know, you can basically pre-deploy cops there to, I guess, push the crime into the next district. I don't know. <laughs> the first prevents any problem does in somebody else's area. Other questions? Um, right there and then there. Sure. Um, when, uh, by making it more like rational city, I guess, with smart cities, do you kind of, because cities are kind of chaotic, like you have Jakarta or even parts of New York. By making it less chaotic, like, do you kind of, is it then less of a city and more of the suburbs, almost? Like, does the charm kind of go away? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, um, so I, I, I was very, um, I read a lot about Foursquare in the book because uh, I know Dennis Crowley really well and I followed his story since the very beginning. Um, and I also think it's a great example of how you can use smart technology not to make a city more efficient or more optimized, but to make it different, to make it more sociable and to sort of amplify that messy interactivity of cities that we love. Um, but at the end, um, at the end of talking about Foursquare, um, I, I point out the fact that Foursquare isn't really a social network anymore. It's, it's now become a recommendation engine. This, this dr grinding off of all the billions of data points they've collected over, over the last couple of years. And like, I was interviewing Dennis, and he's, he's got really excited. He's talking about, um, I'm going to be able to build a service that you know, 1145 will suggest a place for you to go to lunch. And I was like, engineering serendipity, which is something that Greg is really interested in. And the, the question I raised about that, like, is that going to destroy the thing that it's trying to celebrate in the first place, like, um, by, by trying to um, rationalize an almost irrational process? Um, could, could, could Foursquare go from being an amplifier of urbanism to, to a killer of urbanism? And I think, um, you know, there's so much of that embedded in all these systems that um, you have to constantly, um, because because at the end of the day, if they're well designed, they're not going to make any mistakes, right? Um, and like the algorithm is always going to spit out the right recommendation, that the you know the, the, the path of least resistance, and um, you know you'll lose sort of the accidents and the, and the bumps and, the, and the, like getting lost, right? Like whatever happened to getting lost? Um, I would, well, I there's now an app for that, well, Sandy Tipiter, so which will get you lost, yeah. you know, so I, I love Bonfire of the Vanities. That, to me, is like one of the classic New York epics. It's a totally implausible plot line now, because who would get off at the wrong ramp in the Bronx? And that's what sets the whole story in motion, right? It's true. Waze would never let me do that. Um, other questions? You had one. Yeah, you know, Questions out here? We'll get to some in a minute. We're gonna we'll shift this half the table. But first so go. I'm interested in the relationship between smart cities and fragility because on the one hand, bringing more intelligence to cities creates a lot of benefits, but it also to some extent makes us vulnerable to new threats, whether it's cybersecurity or just something as um, you know something like what we experienced during Sandy. Uh, 
on balance, how do you see that? How do you see that playing out? Are we becoming sort of more dependent, or is it, or is it out, outweighed by the new tools that are letting groups like Occupy Sandy respond? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the what the new balance is, but I think the, the fragility is, is a huge issue. Um, I, I wrote a lot about um, several sort of. Um, so I mean, if, if you look at what's happening with some parts of the, the, the internet and the, the sort of informa global information system. There's a massive degree of centralization going on. So, I mean, you can make the argument that the whole internet is in eight buildings in Northern Virginia and, and the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Apple's, Google's, Amazon's, and um, Facebook. Facebook's data centers, yeah. Um, like the whole internet. Um, something like 20% of internet traffic, I think, is internal on Google's corporate network. And then the Well, now they're encrypting. I can't imagine how long the encryption keys are that they're using now. NSA probably won't break them for 500 years, but. Um, and so you get things like uh, 2011, Amazon has a data center outage in Northern Virginia, and the whole country of Israel goes into gridlock for four hours because they have two million people using Waze, this traffic app, and they lose their, um, their directions and their, their traffic information because Amazon was their infrastructure provider. That is so bizarre. I mean, to the point where it was probably which is a national security issue. It was probably a national too. security issue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a real national security issue, um, which nobody would have thought of. And um, Greg and I actually um, both uh, spoke at a, a conference with the, um, a major security company last year. And the guy who uh, runs their think tank internally is an old German military planner. And uh, he was talking about how, like, how we used to design uh, our, our um, command structure, uh, you know, for the Soviet invasion, right? And it was all about like distributed command and autonomy and to be incredibly resilient, to not be fragile. And he, we were talking about smart cities and the centralization of infrastructure and control. And he's like, he's like, these people are totally insane. Um, and we were in particular talking about Singapore, mm -hmm. um, which has invested really heavily in this and has massive <coughs> national security issues and uh, has a very hierarchical centralized control system. And he said, as soon as that gets better, <coughs> the crisis is all going to fall apart. And um, that, that was really telling to me um, that you would have, um, and the same thing happened when you talk to people in disaster planning and, and disaster readiness is they, they are scared of this stuff. They think it's, um, you know, we're sort of selling the seeds of our own destruction. Um, so like, you know, what, is, what does an Atlantis snowpocalypse look like for, you know, a smart city telecommunication system or power system? Um, it's, uh, you, can, you can see little, little hints of it around the world. So like what happened in Japan after Fukushima and like all of a sudden towns are relying on like foot messengers to, to get communications around. Um, uh, what happened in Boston after the, the bombing and again the cell network went down because these things aren't designed for crisis. They're designed for um, routine operation and they're heavily optimized for that routine mode. Um, I think those things are, are inevitable. But at the same time, you know, as you point out, um, the capacity that people now have in their own hands, um, you know, you essentially have a s network supercomputer in your pocket, right? Um, there's amazing things that can be done with that. And, and I think we all saw that in Occupy, where they were able to, to organize, um, you know, with a modicum of, of connectivity when, you know, the official responders of all their resources couldn't find their, their hands from their feet. So. Well, Richard, we'll go around to Richard a question. You still have a question? No? GPS. Well, question, question. Uh, question. Something to think about. Uh, with, so there's an interesting contradiction in uh, two of the responses. Uh, or not contradiction, but an interesting thing to ponder. You mean I contradicted myself? Well, that happens well, every day. Well, no, I mean, we all do, right? We <laughs> can't help it. But um, So on the one hand, it's like the, this idea of, you know, the, the super omniscient machine that never makes a mistake. You know, and when it's running, it doesn't make a mistake. Um, and then, you know, the, you know, well, and then the catastrophic failure of that machine because of, you know, an external event. Or, snowball, yeah. or, you know, in the case of, so it's almost like two kinds of dystopia. Like one is like the Brazil dystopia, a false positive caused by a fly that has all of these sort of cascading, you know, downward impacts. Like what are the unintended consequences of a machine that knows everything? Yeah. Someone makes a mistake and then, Someone's life is you know, ground up. Um, you know, the other is. So I wonder, you know, the the the, the just sort of thinking in terms of a policy framework, right? So how do you make decisions about policies in a world where you can't decide between what kind of a world you're going to have in which you need policies? 
right? Are you going to have a world in which you actually have uh, a reasonable amount of uh, predictability? You know, that's to say, within this range, this non-entropy, <coughs> this entropy-free zone, or, or largely entropy-free zone, you're going to be able to make very, very, very narrow policy predictions about what you're going to do. And then when you're outside of that zone, there's, there's going to be a huge delta between the inside, so let's call it the inside of the machine and the outside of the machine, the feral and the non-feral, or the formal and the informal. And you know, this is a conversation Greg and I have had for a long time. And so how do we begin to think about the, not so much whether the machines are, are, are formal and predictive and when they fail, or when they're informal and informal systems becoming controlled, you know, in you know, Sao Paulo or, or the favelas, classification of favelas is a, a means of taking back the informal into the formal and then maybe someday in a dystopia dialing up and down the access, you know, to the machine. Maybe we have to actually, maybe we, we need new architecture or new mental models you know, for thinking about the formal and the informal, and then just wonder whether or not we have those tools. Like, we, we, we talk about smarter cities, so all the, you know, I've worked with idea on smart cities, and just the, the hope, the, the, the weird hopes that hang on that idea of, oh wait, the machines can do this for us, you know? Um, and then of course you have the other, which is wait, the favelas can do this for us, because actually the favelas are actually these very, very interesting economic machines that we don't understand, and we otherize by saying they're in fact, Actually, they're very well organized, many of them. They have great policy frameworks that, that can be reapplied. You know, So I wonder whether or not the smart cities discussion doesn't somehow run us down one of two rabbit holes mm -hmm. and how we marry those up and what policy looks like when we try to get those two things together. Yeah, I think that's the central question. I mean, I didn't tell this to my editor because he never would have found the book, but essentially a political economy of the smart cities movement, as it were. You know, who are all the stakeholders? What are they seeking to accomplish? And how are they going about doing it? And then, what are the synergies and the conflicts? And um, you know, you could make the argument. And I think some of what I was trying to do with those historical examples of how these same battles played out with earlier technologies, earlier information technologies, during earlier waves of urban change, was to make the point that there's nothing new here at all. It's just new weapons and a political struggle between different interests and our different different stakeholder groups in cities. So um, what are your key variables in the political? So if you, it is political yeah. economy, what are the stakes, regardless of how the, the tactics play out, where do you believe the stakes of political economy are that have been long-lasting, pre-existing computing? Like, where are your commitments in that political economy? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but to me, I think at the end of the day, it's all about land. And urban land not getting any less, any more abundant anywhere in the world. And a lot of the issues in the end come back to like who gets to be aware. Um, but just like to, I don't know, like just as a, a thinking tool to, to try and like make some of this more concrete. Like, what if Watson was your mayor? I you know, would no doubt love that. I'm so working on that use case right now. So what happens? Like, what happens when you've got this thing that's smarter than any anything that you've ever encountered? that just sits at the end of the table like Dr. Theopolis from Buck Rogers saying, do this, mm -hmm. that. You know, and there's a couple guys in you know, priestly robes standing behind it, hoping that you know, it doesn't break. But well, why do we give it that political trust? I mean, so uh, it's it, what if it's asked. really good? What if it does really solve a lot of problems and create a very good quality of life? But who defines what that good? How does that well, good define? Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, to me, this gets this gets yeah. back to this is my larger critique on this. Yeah. What the next question? A second is is to me the notion of this, which I think is the whole flaw in this whole debate, is is that we have no faith in our political leaders. But we have total faith in the technology sector because the technology sector is the last growth sector in the U.S. economy. So when 